Good morning, friends. It's great to greet you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Pastor George Rowe from the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle right here in Chetwin. Today, I'm going to talk about love, love, and more love. Yeah, this presentation was put together during uh, Valentine's week, and so that's why I want to talk about love today. I want to quote Jesus in John 13 and 34, and he said, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Wow! Love one another as I have loved you. Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travel that goes back to uh, 1726, just a few years before I was born, he made this quote, We have just enough of religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. And yet Jesus exhorts us to love one another as he loved us. And so during Valentine week, we are exposed to a somewhat superficial surface kind of love that sometimes is only as deep as a pie crust. But we make every attempt to express our love to our spouses, our children, our extended families, and our friends. And in expressing that love, we kind of, sometimes we'll buy a sentimental card. Sometimes there's a floral arrangement, or we even dare buy jewelry. We take our spouse out to a lovely dinner, give them a kiss on the cheek, play a favorite song, and we do these things to express our love, to tell them, I love you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with any attempt we make to show, to display, to express our love. The intentions are commendable. But today, I want to talk about a love that is not self-produced or invented in a lab or found in a cosmetic bottle or simply discovered by the reading of a book or sitting through a romantic movie. I want to talk about a love that is produced in heaven and comes from the very heart of God. It is a love without dimensions. In Greek, there are a number of words that's used to describe love. For instance, there is eros. It talks about an erotic, passionate love between partners. There is philia, or some call it filio. It's the love of friends and our equals. There's a storge love, which is usually the love that parents would pay toward their children. And there is agape. That's the love I want to talk about today. Agape is an unconditional love. That's the kind of love that God has for you and me. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, the unconditional love of God is definitely not something invented in a lab. It is not found in a textbook. It is not produced by the efforts of humankind. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Just follow me here for a moment. This concept of love is not new. The Old Testament says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Well, in John 13 and 34, Jesus is setting a new standard of love. He says, love as I have loved you. And it's a love without pretension. It is a love without conditions. It is to love without expecting anything in return. To love, though we may feel that we ourselves are unloved. Agape is to love, though you may have sometimes been misunderstood. You see, we aren't really loving people until we love as Jesus loved us. And you might say, well, Pastor George, I cannot love like that. I'm not capable of loving like that. It is not within me to love people as Jesus loved me. You know what? You are right. You're right on. Within ourselves, we cannot love people as Jesus loved them. But remember that God is love. And get this, God lives in you. And because God lives in you, then you are filled with the love of God. And as Christians who are God-filled and Jesus-filled and Holy Spirit-filled, then that love within us, the love of God that is within us, we can pour it out of our lives into the lives of other people. Amen? Paul says in Romans, God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Isn't that awesome? And so when God pours it in, we reciprocate that love by reaching out and loving other people as Jesus loved us. Corinth was a church that Paul had established in about, oh, 50, 55 AD, and he was proud of his church. It was a cosmopolitan community. It was diverse in so many ways, but it became a splintered church. And Paul needed to address it because the Bible says, after all, above all, love each other dearly because love covers over a multitude of sin. So how is Paul going to address the divisions and the strife and the difficulties and the challenges within the Corinthian church? Just as we as pastors today would address problematic situations in our church, Paul talks about love. Now remember, 1 John says, God is love. And so here's what Paul says about love. Love is patient and kind. Love is never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud. This is agape love. Love never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly ever notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending them. Can we do that in our own strength? Absolutely not. In fact, we can't even train ourselves to love in that kind of a way. But remember, as I said earlier, because God lives in your heart, and because God is love, God is love, we can help other people around us by simply expressing the love of God. And Paul finishes by saying to the splintered, divisive church in Corinth, there are three things that still remain. 
There's faith, there is hope, and there is love. But the greatest of these is love. Let me give you some good advice here. I would suppose that 99% of what I've said already this morning, you agree with. You agree with this kind of love that must be amplified or amplified by Christians. We know that. Intellectually, we know it. Within our heart, we believe it. But are we always doing it? Are we exercising that love for those around us? So some good advice today. Don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. In other words, yeah, pastor, I believe it. I know it. I accept it in my heart. And day after day after day, I want to amplify the agape love of God. And you know the best way to start? Right in your own home, with your spouse, with your children, within your church, within your community, with your fellow workers. Just reach out in love, and God will bless you. Have yourself an awesome day. Just allow me a moment to pray with you. And so, God, you are a God of love. And I pray right now for those who are watching and that those who are listening, that your love will not only be in them, but around them and will govern them every single day. If there are those today who are hurting for lack of love, let your love fill them. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Have an awesome day. God's blessing upon you. Amen. Good day, folks. My name is Lori Mickelson, and I pastor the Nazarene Church here in Chetwin. We're glad you are with us today. Let's open in prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word that brings us direction, peace, and wisdom. Open our ears this day to hear your message that is available to all. Encourage us with your words and teach us with your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to look into the into John chapter 6. Jesus had been teaching the masses of people who were following him. Now, just because they were following him doesn't mean they were committed to his cause. For those of you on social media sites, following means those people are interested in what you are saying. They may not necessarily agree with you or even know you, but that is the case with those who followed Jesus at that time. John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then came the well-known miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. But just a minute here. One can see how and why they followed him. He was doing wonderful things. But listen for just a minute as to what happened the next day. John 6, 22 to 34. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, 
I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal light that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Even after the mir miracle of feeding the 5,000, they asked Jesus for a miraculous sign to prove to them that he was the one that had been sent. They wanted him to help them perform miracles too. All of their reasons for following Jesus were based on what they could get to satisfy their physical hunger and gain prestige. We still see the same thing happening today. Unfortunately, there are some belief systems that don't help Jesus' cause by claiming that you will gain everything you want if you follow. They teach prosperity and complete peace. But none of these things are found in anything that we have gained on the earth. God gives us what we need, and no, we don't need a million dollars in the bank. Those are things we may want, but we don't need them. We need to be cemented in Christ. He is the only peace that can truly sustain us through anything that the world throws at us. There is no peace found anywhere else. So what was Jesus' response to the request, give us that bread every day? John 6, 35 to verse 40. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at that last day. Now that's a promise we can take to the bank, God's bank. One would think that would put an end to the discussion and that they would all be accepting God's precious gift. But alas, people are human, and that isn't the response. John 6, 41 and 42. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? They were still looking at Jesus as the carpenter from Nazareth. They couldn't wrap their heads around him being the divine son of God. But that's not all they couldn't accept. They couldn't accept the demands that Christ made for their loyalty and their obedience. So what do they do? They reject the messenger. There is a story that illustrates this so well that I can't help but insert here. There was a hen and a pig who saw the plight of the poor and the hungry. They joined together to give those disadvantaged something to eat. But there was a difference in their offering to help with bacon and eggs every morning. To the hen, it was a regular donation that required very little effort. But to the pig, it was a firm commitment that required sacrifice. The people who often followed Jesus didn't want to have that firm commitment of obedience until death. They just wanted the regular donation that required very little effort. But now back to our study in John. Jesus has still more to say this to this group of followers. John 6, 43 to 51. But Jesus replied, Stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, 
They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer to the world so the world may live, is my flesh. There it is, the gospel in a nutshell. But we do not believe just once, and that is the end of the story. It's an ongoing process. Believe means continues to believe. When Jesus talked to them about the manna that God supplied to the people of Moses, he reminded them that this was a physical bread. It was bread that was collected every morning. It only kept them for the day that they ate it. They had to get more for the next day. And that bread couldn't keep them from dying. So how do we keep eating the bread that is the body of Jesus? We study. We learn from the experience that God experiences that God places in our lives. We listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit teaching us and reminding us with the nudges to our spirit and by our relationships with other believers. To eat this living bread means to accept Christ into our lives and become invited with him by believing in his death as a sacrifice for sin, in his resurrection and devoting ourselves to living as he would want us to live and to depend upon his teaching for guidance. And he has sent his Holy Spirit to fill us with the strength and the power to accomplish this. So, did the people accept these answers from our Savior? Did they take the plate of bread that was passed to them? We would like to think so, but... John 6, 53-59 Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, and yes, lest you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks his blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Now you and I know what Jesus is referring to here. He is talking about the Last Supper, communion. But the people of Jesus' day thought that was cannibalistic talk. Their Jewish faith forbade it in Leviticus 17, verse 10 to 11. But Jesus wasn't talking about literal blood. He was saying that his life had to become part of their own. It was a concept that they just couldn't accept. So what did they do? They started to argue, a typical human response. And as we all know, arguments lead to John 7, 6 to 66. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware of that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you going to leave as well? Why would Jesus talk about the body and blood, give so many of his dis followers to desert him? Well, there are several reasons. Some of them may have finally realized that he was not going to take over the earthly kingdom and give them the freedom they thought. They wanted a conquering Messiah that restored their kingdom. Some may have been discouraged by his refusal to give in to their requests of food and power to do miracles. There would have been some who disagreed that faith was more important than anything they'd do. 
faith just didn't seem enough. Some of the word pictures Jesus used, like body and blood of Christ, were difficult to understand and sound offensive. But we know now that the Holy Spirit helps us to learn along the way. Things become clearer as we grow older. So the next time you find yourself in a quandary about what Jesus meant about something, remind yourself the Holy Spirit is here to help you and just listen and give it time. But what about the 12? John 6, 68 to 71. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, I chose the 12 of you, but one is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the 12 who would later betray him. There is no middle ground with Jesus. He came out point blank and asked the disciples if they were going to leave too. He gave them a choice. The more the people heard Jesus' real message, the more divided they divided into two camps. Those who wanted to understand more and those who rejected his messages because they didn't like what he, they heard. But Peter answered for all of them, where would they go? We can ask ourselves the same question. Where would I go? We see so many people who race around looking for answers to life's questions, looking for peace where there is no peace, and yet all this we have been blessed with every day. No, it's not always comfortable. It's not always easy, but we can rest in knowing that no matter what hits our radar has been known by God all along. What better hands to be in but to be in the hands of the one who created us? Let's close with prayer. O oh Lord, teach us to be wise and listen to your wisdom. Then give us the strength and courage to follow it. Thank you for the life you have given us and guide us into eternity. Amen. I'm Jillian McDonald, a local Tim Hortons owner for Chetwind. And it's camp day and all of our proceeds from hot and iced coffee go to the Tim's Foundation camps. Um, at the restaurants locally, we're doing a bunch of different incentives. Um, pick a sucker for a chance to win a prize. We are doing toss a toonie for prizing as well as selling Camp Day bracelets and Camp Day socks. So in the 30 year history of Camp Day, we have nationally raised $225 million and helped send over 300,000 kids to camp between the ages of 12 and 16. Come on down to your local Tim Hortons or if you're in Chetwin, come see us. Uh, we have police officers washing windows in the drive through lane, which is always a fun time. Please come and help us send a kid to camp. not there anymore so just remember me I'll remember